I, I asked uh, Earl if I could ask him a question at the beginning of the session. I'm sorry that we didn't have time for Q&A after the last session. Uh, but there's just such great stuff coming at us that we, I think we've all really enjoyed it. I, uh, I don't know how you're feeling, but many of you that did graduate from seminary and studied Greek are, during these sessions, wishing you would have kept up with it. Yeah. Uh, you're having this, this great regret when you see this guy that's just spilling all this stuff out. And, and if you're preaching this Sunday, you're feeling like, you know, can I get a substitute? Can somebody else? Yeah, I've got to brush up my Greek before I get out there. Uh, and, and then others of you have never studied Greek. And uh, so you're kind of like, okay, <laughs> this is awesome what he's doing, but like, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. And uh, I, I mentioned last night that I invited a young rapper. Uh, not a like a gum rapper, an actual musical <laughs> rapper, uh, to come as he was a new Christian to Earl's expository preaching because I figured he loves words. He wrote uh, he wrote a, a rap right after he became a believer that was about his meth addiction and communion that was unbelievable, and I just thought this kid's getting it. So so I asked him to come in. He didn't know Greek, but he had written the Greek alphabet. Without me even saying anything about what this is going to be about, he'd read about the event, and he'd written the Greek alphabet out in the inside of his notebook, and so that he could start trying to learn some Greek words. And it's not, it's not, there, the good news is there's so many resources today that if you've let it go a bit, or if you don't really know it, but you want to know a little bit more about the, the vocabulary and the words, you can do it. So I asked uh, Reverend Palmer if he would just mention a few resources that he thinks are useful. Uh, lexicons, Bible dictionary type things, and of course many, many more resources are available online. So I'm going to turn over to uh, uh, Reverend Earl Palmer. Our response is going to be from Dr. Osmer following uh, Earl. And, uh, but Earl's going to start by at least mentioning some resources so that we will not lose heart. <laughs> Sorry. Or even lose faith. Uh, I haven't felt that might happen. But. Well, I want to thank uh, Nancy Rose for uh, the wonderful lesson on exposition. She really uh, did. And also she impressed how important it is to work. You have to do some work. And I was so proud of her. It's just a, it was just wonderful. And, of course, Daryl earlier on, uh, uh, I just, uh, uh, to me, this day has been, I, I know we're working you hard today, but that's why tonight's off. You know, you, don't, you, don't, you can go wherever you want to go tonight and kind of relax, but we are, uh, we are working you hard today, and then tomorrow will be lighter because it's just the morning. But it, is, it has been a joy all the way along. Uh, yes, when it comes to resources, of course, one, <laughs> I, I shouldn't give a commercial because uh, – there are commentaries on all the books of the Bible, and there are some commentaries you can get that are of the whole Bible. Those are less valuable because they just tell you obvious stuff that you really didn't need to know as much. But the commentaries on individual books, there are some absolutely great ones, and the commentator should give you alerts to words and language. That is something a commentator is supposed to owe you. I wrote a commentary on Philippians, and since Philippians is only four chapters, it's a, a fairly short commentary, but I did do it, and I, had a, I just loved writing that commentary. I, I titled it to, to Run the Race, but it's, it's a commentary in which I alert you to a whole lot of these words. For instance, I alert you to this word because it, it's kind of a spectacular use of the word by, by St. Paul. I don't tell you about uh, J.R. Tolkien's words, you catastrophe, but I, I just used, I did, I did quite a little study of the use of, of kata, and of dia, like I did with you. And so a commentator is supposed to do a lot of that stuff for you. And also, I did a lot on the historical setting of, of the, uh, the fire of Rome and what was, what was this, the historical setting of the Christians in the 60s when Paul writes his, uh, oh, I get a cigar? No. <laughs> That's why I'm late. He's late? <laughs> You know, I had a, a, p a police officer at, at, my, at my church in Seattle, and he's the one who supplied me with cigars all the time because 
I, I did let it out once that I smoked cigars outdoors. And so uh, I, I do it with my son. So I have to wait with my son to get home and, wow, this is important. Well, I, th that is a very expensive cigar. <laughs> so <laughs> we do that outdoors, never indoors. It's, it ruins everything. But at any rate, uh, a, commentary, a commentary is supposed to do that. Now, w without that, and you can you buy commentaries as you feel a, a book is really uh, keen, uh, uh, important to you, and you want to preach on it or teach on it. And I advise Karl Barth's commentary on Romans, for instance, the Roman brief. It's how he broke into into the world with that commentary. He spent nine years writing that commentary, then brought out three different editions of the Roman brief. You can get it at Oxford University Press. And it is amazing commentary on Romans, Karl Barth. Martin Luther's commentary on Romans, just simply called Lectures on Romans. A wonderful a handling of the book of Romans. So you get a few classics like that. Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book on the Sermon on the Mount, which is, of course, the cost of discipleship. And uh, again, handling words, handling text. So you do collect a few uh, don't buy everything. Don't ever join Book of the Month Club. But you get books that uh, on authors that you collect people that mean a lot to you. I've, I have collected authors who mean a great deal to me because then, in a way, you learn a little bit how they think. So that's one genre would be just commentaries on the great texts, and there are some great ones. Uh, ordinary workbooks that are good would be your Dictionary of the Bible. The Hastings Dictionary of the Bible is a one-volume, wonderful Dictionary of the Bible. I always have it right next to my desk, so I can quickly go to that over any technical. Do you realize there is no technical name or place or uh, incident in the New Testament that is not, does not have an article in the Dictionary of the Bible? Uh, it, you look up a word like Pharisee, for instance, and it will give you the history of the Pharisee movement. You look up Sadducee, it will tell you that. So you don't uh, uh, say nonsense in a sermon. I've had pastors uh, preach on Pharisees and talk about as if they were clergy. Pharisees were not clergy. That is the text you use to get after your laity because they were laymen. <laughs> the Sadducees were clergy, but not the Pharisees. So don't, don't make a mistake and make a fool of yourself in front of kids that have taken a course in your class and know that the Pharisees were a lay movement. And, uh, but there were some great Pharisees, like, of course, Hillel was a great Pharisee. So you have the Pharisees. The Book Dictionary of the Bible will give you an article on every place name, every person, and they'll tell you what we know or don't know. Now, as a matter of fact, Erdman's has published a four-volume Dictionary of the Bible. Now, that is a little more choking. I have that, too. But it's, got, it's just too many articles, maybe, for you just to have right at your desk. There is the possibility, in, with regard to Greek, of, of getting an interlinary uh, translation of the New Testament, which would be, and there's a number of them out, where you have the English and the Greek side by side, so that you, now you do have to know some lexical use of Greek, because the dictionary of uh, a liner, interlinary will have the English, and underneath it will have the Greek word for it, and then you can go to the to an Arndt Gingrich uh, lexicon. The one volume Arndt Gingrich is a, a usable lexicon that I use all the time. It's one of the historic great lexicons, which has every single Greek word in the New Testament. And the nice thing about it is, in Arndt Gingrich, with very few failures, any word that you look up there, like agape or anything like that, well, maybe not agape because it's used so much, they'll show you every place in the New Testament that word is used. If they put a little asterisk at the bottom of the article, that means every single place where that book uh, word appears is in this citation. And man, the work they've done for you. They'll show you, for instance, that a word like trexo is used in so many places, and you'll find it. And then it'll, it'll just direct you to the new, so you don't even need to know Greek to do that. But you can get the use of an interlinary which will track the word for you. I'm reading the English and underneath, oh, that's Trexel. Now I go into the Arndt Gingrich, and Arndt Gingrich will tell me everywhere where that word is used. And you, now that's work, but I'll tell you, it is intoxicating. When you start doing it, you begin to get caught up in it. I always said that was really true about uh, encyclopedias or dictionaries. When you do an encyclopedic study, always read the article on each side. If you do a, a word study in an in a lexicon, look at both sides to see how the word was used or other words that are like it. Now, if you have this much a space, you can get the Ketel 
uh, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament and Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. It's that many w books. It costs about $700 to buy it brand new, but used, you can get it maybe for $100 from some pastor who quit the ministry, or, <laughs> or he died and his family quit the ministry. His family wants to sell it. But you can get a used set of the Ketel, a used set of this absolutely monumental work for a problem, maybe $100, $150. And it's in the library. You can go to the New York Public Library. I love the New York Public Library. You can go to the reading room of the New York Public Library. I have no sympathy for a pastor in New York City who says I can't study. All you have to do is go on Fifth Avenue to the New York Public Library. Go up to the reading room, free of charge. Sit in there and look at the dictionaries of the Bible. They have every dictionary of the Bible there is. They have Ketel, everything right there, free of charge. That you have a desk, you take it down and read it, study it, and you have a field day, plus it's a great place to go. And every, every seminary has that. If you're near a seminary, they'll let you use it. They'll let you do it here at Princeton. You go right in, and they, you go into the center part of the, of the library, and you'll see all the dictionaries and all these, what I would call these workbooks, that are available to every student. And you sit at a desk. You, t you can't take it out of the building, but you can sit at a desk, or you can do it on computers. Computers give you all this stuff, too. I, the thing about a computer I don't like is I like to take notes and write it down on paper. And with your computer, it's a little more complicated. You can't write in your computer and stuff. But I'll tell you, you can get all, you can get all this lexical help also through computers uh, and through uh, word searches. So is that enough help? See, a dictionary of the Bible, a commentary. And then when you collect that stuff, do it in terms of books you're working on. If you're a pastor or a teacher and you're going to teach on a book, maybe you owe it to yourself to, to actually invest in a classic book if, so you have it in your library. I have a, a library that it means a lot to me. I have collected Karl Barth. I have everything. I have collected Bonhoeffer. It's easy to collect Bonhoeffer. That's only that many books. I've got all those. I've got C.S. Lewis. I have three shelves of just sheer C.S. Lewis. Not all the books written about him, but all the things he wrote. I've got them. And, and, you know, it becomes a collection. And when you die and you leave that, you're leaving something of value. That's not like Book of the Month Club, Reader's Digest books. Nobody wants those. But classic books, people want. I've collected G.K. Chesterton. I have all of Chesterton. I have all of Dorothy Sayers. I have all of Robert Benchley, my favorite comic. I've got all of Mark Twain. I've collected people that I'm interested in. And it's fun to read them and, and to make a friend of those now, it, it, on the other hand, it's used up space in your house, yes. and that is a big problem. But okay, it's another subject. But at any rate, uh, I think you can collect a dictionary of the Bible. One dictionary of the Bible is the Hastings. When I taught a class in, in Manila to my students in the Union Church and Union Seminary in Manila, I tried about what could be a gift I could get each one of those students, and I got them each a Hastings dictionary of the Bible and had it sent to us in, the, in Manila, and, and it cost a lot of money, and then I took it down and presented it to every one of my students. They so treasured that book because they all knew English. They all worked with English, but not many of them could afford to buy the Hastings Dictionary of the Bible. It's, it would be too much money, but it was the kind of – if you have a student that you want to give them a gift, why not give them that kind of gift, uh, something that they wouldn't necessarily buy but would always be right there if they're going to be a teacher – it's always going to be right there, so they're accurate. That way, when they quote something, they're accurate. You know what I mean? I'll tell you something. I don't want to overdo this, but when you're talking to the audiences today, you need to know, one, the historical context of when something was said. You know how Nancy Gross helped us so much? When St. Paul says, women, obey your husbands, many women are outraged to hear that today, except if they knew the context in which it was said. The context in which Paul said, women, obey your husbands, everybody knew that. The part that was scandalous was men. You should treasure your wives and sacrifice for your wives. Men didn't do that in the first century. They saw women as a property. And Paul is scandalizing them. It's that. He, he didn't scandalize them with women, obey your parents. Your, because then he tells the husbands also to obey the commitment they made to marriage. And so he puts men under it. And he does a magnificent job. And she helped us today to see that you need to know the cultural setting of, of words, where they appear, when they appear, so that you rightly handle them now when they appear. And uh, 
So that's what a commentary will do, and that's what uh, word studies can do to help you. But by all means, try to be as accurate as possible when you make a reference to the Pharisees, or make a reference to the Sadducees, or make a reference to the Herodians, or make a reference to Nero, or make a reference to St. Aug uh, Augustine. Now, you won't get that help in the Dictionary of the Bible. The Dictionary of the Bible will only tell you about people that are in the Bible. Now, for the other, you have to get... Uh, the dic uh, there are dictionaries of the history of the Christian church. Uh, Kenneth Scott Latourette wrote a whole thing on the history of the Christian church. That's worth buying, too, so that you can speak accurately about St. Augustine or you can speak accurately about John Calvin, okay? And that is a great help in doing exposition. Today, we continue our text in 2 Timothy. And uh, just at the very end of what we did uh, uh, we notice that St. Paul begins after he, s he gives his confession of faith and then he urges Timothy to select uh, teachers that will be wise and handle their teaching uh, 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 wisely. Then, uh, then he actually uh, takes on a crisis within the church. It has nothing to do with the Roman world putting pressure on the church. It's a crisis within the church, and he gives this quotation. He doesn't. He decides not to write the quotation off. He uh, gives the quotation, if we died with him, we will live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. We're kind of wincing when we hear that. And if we are faithless, ah, pistis, away from faith, he remains faithful. And then Paul adds the line, for he cannot deny himself. And then Paul warns us not to to have warfare over words. I was talking with somebody after that today at lunch. The warfare over words, somebody wondered, what does that mean, moxa? He uses the word for war. Uh, that would be, be careful. He warns us against having the killer instinct when you're arguing with somebody about words. And that killer instinct, in fact, he then uses gangrene as an example of the killer instinct. When you have warfare over words, Sometimes you, in your desire to win the argument, develop a kind of killer instinct. I want to destroy your argument. I want to, and sometimes I want to destroy you. I want to, and sometimes you'll see that happening in Christian circles where somebody wants you to answer a question, but they want you to jump through a hoop in a certain way. And if you don't, they'll tackle you and they'll say, look, you don't believe in the inspiration of Scripture or you don't believe in, in the gospel or you don't do this. And before you know it, the killer instinct is there and it's a, Paul says it's a warfare over words. And that's why he uses warfare. He, because war is the art of killing. War is killing. And then he, that killer instinct can do more harm in a family where a father is arguing with his son over politics and takes a position against his son or his son takes a position against the father where the killer instinct is at work. And you want to destroy the argument of your son. Hopefully that will correct him and will put them on the right path. It doesn't. It really doesn't. It rarely, it rarely, like Paul says, it doesn't build up the body. It tears the body down. And he warns against that. I think there's so much pastoral wisdom in what Paul does in that section that it's just astounding. The wisdom of this man is to see that happening in the church at <coughs> Ephesus, and he doesn't want to see it happen any longer. Doesn't want that killer instinct. He wants an edifying instinct. And you can have, by the way, don't use that text to say that Paul means you shouldn't argue. We argue a lot. And you can argue fair and square. And when you argue fair and square, where uh, you agree to disagree with someone, that's not the killer instinct. Uh, provided you respect them and, and give them respect for what they're saying. And also it present uh, or preserve your own ambiguities. Preserve your own uh, the fact that, that I've made a wager on the truth, but I'm pulling back because I have confidence that in the truth making its own point, and then you pull back from that killer instinct, which Paul warns against. I just think it's wonderful. Now, with that, he, uh, he goes on, and we'll uh, watch him uh, continue his text. Uh, verse 10 now continues. Now you've observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim. Uh, that the word aim there is my way, my way, my way in life. 
is uh, the RSV is translating it my aim in life. Uh, this, oh wait, I, uh, yeah, I, I, that's the next ver chapter. Um, wait, I, I, I went ahead too far. I want to go back to where I left off after uh, his warning. Yeah, 219, yeah, not 310. I jumped the whole chapter ahead. Uh, in 219, in a large house, okay. <laughs> yes, in a large house, there are utensils uh, not only of gold and silver, but also of wood, clay, and some for special use, some for ordinary. Paul has used this uh, sort of image or model before, like in Corinthians. All who cleanse themselves of the things I have mentioned will become special utensils. Notice he doesn't say wood utensils are inferior to gold utensils or silver ones. He just says you're a utensil. You're, you, you have been uh, called and, you, and you've been set apart. So uh, I have mentioned will become special utensils dedicated and useful to the owner of the house, ready for every good work. And now comes a passage that I think has sometimes been uh, incorrectly handled uh, by uh, the, the preaching pastor uh, who wants to use this text. Verse 22, shun, uh, literally the word means flee, flee from youthful passions. Okay, I have to do a, a word study with you there. The word youthful is a, is a fairly for, forthright word. It just means young, youthful, passions. The word for passion is the word thuma, uh, and that is the word for passion uh, uh, or desire. When you see the simple word desire appear in a text, it usually means it's a variation on thuma. But if you put an epi in front of it, that is an intensifier. And the word for passion in the New Testament is epi thuma. Thuma, which means desire, not a bad word, it's a neutral word. Epi intensifies it. And that would be uh, strong desire or extreme desire. And sometimes that's the word translated in New Testament texts as lust. It's not translated that way here, fortunately, because I don't think, because when we think of epithuma, and in, and in some passages where he's talking about sexual ethics especially, he'll maybe use the word epithuma to refer to lust. Uh, runaway desire. That's really what epithuma is. It's runaway desire. It's extreme desire. He says shun extreme desire or passions and pursue righteousness. And now he has one of his lists. Faith, love, peace, among those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. By the way, the word pure heart, pure is probably not the best word. It is actually the word katharizo. It means a washed heart. Washed doesn't mean pure. It means it's been washed up, a little bit washed. Now, that's different than pure. And I think it's too bad that the RSV translated it pure. They probably should have translated it with katharizo, the idea washed, a washed heart. Okay. Uh, and then, to make sure that you understand what he's getting at, he then goes on. Have nothing to do with stupid. By the way, that is the word moron in Greek. <laughs> it is the word moron, stupid, without meaning. See, what, uh, so a person is a moron ha does not have reason. Uh, so it's one of the words used for, uh, in a pejorative way, so some people would be moronic. They don't have reason in their thinking. So they're not reasonable. So... Uh, have nothing to do with, with moron, foolish, and senseless. Now, the word senseless means away, it uses the word a from learning, away from learning. See, he doesn't want careless thinking. Paul, you can see with Timothy, wants him to think clearly. Remember earlier he said a sound mind, a healthy mind. Now he's coming back to that again. I don't want you to think uh, with moron, foolish, and away from learning controversies. See? The same thing. Now, that's back to him commenting. See what he's done? He's picked up the danger of warfare over words. We're in the next paragraph, but he's still got that in his mind. The warfare over words can result in moron, away from learning controversies, and, and you know that they breed quarrels, and now that's that word maxim again. 
they, they breed wars. They actually breed wars. And so he uses the, the word, the RSV decides to translate Maxim there, Maxis as quarrels. They breed war, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. There's again the same word, but now in its long form, uh, warlike. The, uh, they breed uh, away from, they breed moronic and away from learning controversies. And by the way, the word for controversy is from the Greek word zeal, zealousness. Uh, yes, zealousness is the word that's used there. They breed kind of a moronic, away from learning, zealousness. You, you, folks, that's fanaticism. That's fanaticism. He's talking about fanaticism now. A fanatic uh, is Lord Ronald who leaped on his horse and rode madly off in all directions. But it's, <laughs> it's fanaticism. It's not, it's moronic. It's not, it's away from learning. They haven't thought it through. And it's zealous to the nth degree. See, epithumus. It's, it's extreme passion. Extreme passion. And it's not helpful. It breeds warfare. And uh, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, warlike, but kindly to everyone and an apt teacher and patient. By the way, guess what the word for patient is in he Greek language? It's the word thuma with macro. Macro thuma. I remember you did a word study on that at National Presbyterian Church. Macrothuma means to take your desires over the long haul, to divert your desires. It's like the, the young person that holds back on being sexually promiscuous to save for the time when I commit myself to the person who's going to be my, the love of my life. And so I am macrothuma. I'm patient. See, I restrain. I'm macro. I take the long view. Regard. Notice it doesn't deny my desires. But I take the long view with regard to my desires. I want my desires to really be fulfilled. So it's macrothuma. So he uses the word macrothuma not in a sexual context at all, but in a context of fanaticism. Okay, now this is where I want to clear up the air. I have heard pastors preach on this and think that Paul is talking about the youth should shun sexual promiscuity. This is not about sexual promiscuity. It's about political fanaticism or religious fanaticism. It's sad. I hate to say this because I love youth, but youth are the most vulnerable for radical fanaticism. There are not many old people in the ISIS. Even in the Gospel of John in the 8th chapter when the crowd brought a woman caught in adultery and they threw it at Jesus' feet, and they said, the law says she should be stoned. What do you say? Talk about a question. They quote the law from Leviticus and say, you should, what do you say? He's been in a rock and a hard place. If he says stone her, they'll say, and then, the, then he breaks Roman law because then that's become a mob action, and the Romans don't allow that. If he says don't stone her, then say, ah, you don't love the law. You're not for the law. You're a, you're a softy. You know, you're, not, you're of no value. And Jesus, <laughs> you know, it's great. He, the woman's there throwing his feet. He just stoops down and writes in the sand. Don't preach a sermon on what he wrote in the sand. <laughs> you don't know what he wrote in the sand. And I like what Helmut Tiedeke says. The way to interpret that passage is he slowed everything down. And you have to do that in peacemaking. You have to slow everything down. That doesn't mean you write their sins on the sand. Oh, no. <laughs> Jesus didn't do that. He, but he stooped down and wrote in the sand, and then finally, then they start asking more and more, what do you say about her? What do you say? And then, of course, he stands and says, the one who's without sin, throw the first rock. But then he stooped down again. So if they're going to stone her, they have to do it very accurately. Because, you know, in stoning, the tragedy of stoning is a person is usually buried. Everybody gets away from the person, and they're stoned. But he would have to get away. And then they could stone her without anybody around. But he won't move. He stays there. And now the next line I love from the Gospel of John. They all left him 
from the oldest to the youngest. One thing about older people is they do recognize their sinfulness earlier than young people, if you're, if you're smart. You recognize your own ambiguities <laughs> before your kids. And the kids are the last to recognize their, their own ambiguities. And so the young were maybe willing to be the fanatics, but not the older. The older people left. And then the young people left. And then the woman's alone. And Jesus says, where are your accusers? He wants her to say it, that they've gone. Neither do I accuse you. And then he calls her to the way of righteousness. Go and sin no more. And do you know the next line, you know, some critics said, oh, this chapter uh, in John's gospel should not be there. It, it was squeezed in because it's put in the end of Luke and some books. And because of the, it may be uh, the one example in my commentary on John, I, I said this is a possibility of where uh, there was an attempt to make the book more politically correct and not make it look like Jesus was soft on adultery. And so some uh, people who are ordering the manuscripts to be written said, you know, take that passage out. But those monks were, had too much integrity to do that. So they, if they took it out of John 8, they squeezed it in over in Luke. Because we found it in all the manuscripts, the Eastern and Western manuscripts, in different places. But this is where it belongs. It belongs right there. Because you know what the next line is? This is during the Feast of Tabernacles when it happened. And the, the big, uh, you know, the big cauldrons had been burning for the Feast of Tabernacles. And now they're smoldering out because this was the day after the Feast of, Feast of Tabernacles. And he walks and he says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me will not walk in darkness. He answered their question. The law is fulfilled. Notice it's fulfilled by redemption. It's fulfilled uh, not by you punishing somebody else. It's in God's hands. And it's a marvelous passage. But notice what happens. Jesus, he outwits youthful, runaway passion. And now Paul, picking up, uh, I don't think he's referring to our Lord with the woman caught in adultery scene, but Paul picks that up by saying, shun, flee from youthful, so I'm going to translate it this way. If you read my commentary, you'll see I do. Flan, flee from youthful, runaway zeal. Runaway desire, where you're going to say, man, I'm going to go after these bad people that are really bad. I'm going to, I'm going to use a scorched earth approach and really get them, and that will cause social change or something like that, or I'll get even with the people I'm against. And he says, shun that, uh, pursue, notice, truth, pursue righteousness, the justice of God, pursue faith, pursue love, pursue peace among those who call on the name of the Lord from a washed heart, not pure, pure is the wrong word, washed, from a washed heart, have nothing to do with moronic and away from learning, controversies, zeal zealousness or fanaticism you know that they breed war and the lord's servant must not be warlike but kindly to everyone and apt and now comes the big word of what paul wants timothy to be if you're going to look at the book of second timothy and say what does paul want timothy to be a teacher a teacher I'm glad that in the Presbyterian Church, we are called ruling elders. I mean, we're, no, I'm glad we're called <laughs> teaching elders. I'm glad we're not called ruling elders. Uh, uh, they, they changed it to professional clergy. I don't like that. But we're a teaching elder in the history of the Reformed faith. I like that. John Calvin had a teaching desk in the, in the front of the church, at, at, not an altar. That's in the Lutheran Church, in the Episcopal in the Catholic Church's altar, in the, in the Reformed Church, it was a communion table and a teaching desk to teach the Word of God. And now he's calling on Timothy to be a patient teacher, patient teacher, a macrothuma. Take your time. Take your time and teach. Okay. And now uh, we continue correcting uh, opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant that they will repent. You know, he doesn't say, and they will always repent. <laughs> you aren't sure they will. But perhaps they will. You know, their freedom is not taken away. Have you ever thought of the great 
evangelistic passage in the book of Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. It's not, Behold, I'm coming in. <laughs> whether you like it or not, you'll like it, of course, because I'm the Lord of all, and we'll have a <laughs> nice meal for you, but I'm coming in whether you like it or not. No, no. It's, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, notice, you're given, your executive right to have agency is preserved. Anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. So perhaps they will repent. Metanoi means turn around or change their mind. Perhaps they will repent and come to know the truth and that they may escape from the snare. That, that literally is the word entrapment, the, the snare of the devil. You know, the devil only has one power. The devil does not have the power to destroy you, but he does have the power to tempt you. He has the power to tempt you because your executive authority was not canceled out in the fall. In the fall, you have, you're still have uh, authority, and the authority was not taken away. Uh, and that is both good news and maybe bad news in a way, but it is good news. And but that means you can be snared. It means you can be tempted. And so be, be, maybe they'll escape from the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will. Because when they, uh, when they give way to temptation, and when I give way to temptation, I end up captive to what tempts me. And th we know that fanaticism happens this way. And you end up doing things you never would have done. Uh, and in your right mind, you never would have done. And yet there was the gang was all doing it, and so I got caught up. All right, uh, the now comes to the third chapter. You must understand this, that in the uh, eschaton days, he used the word eschaton, last days. By the way, that's, uh, Telica calls that the prophetic shortening of time. All the prophets of the New Testament think of this as the last days because after the uh, radical in interruption of Christ, we are now in the last days, and we've been in the last days for 2,000 years now. So don't start counting or figuring how, how many uh, signs and wonders you can get that will get the last day. That's all in God's hands. You, uh, Lewis has a great line. You might as well leave it in his hands because it's in his hands whether you leave it or not. <laughs> and uh, so why not leave it in his hands? But he uses the word eschaton there. These last days, there are distressing times will come. Uh, now he's no longer just talking about the bad people in, in Ephesus who are tricking the people with bad doctrine. He's now just talking about the Roman world itself. And I'm not going to uh, give you every single word in this list. It is true Paul likes lists. And we are rejoicing over that sometimes. And we are saying, Paul, you got my point. I got it. You don't have to keep saying it. Uh, and other times. His list of sin in Romans is too long a list, and his list uh, here of sins and uh, foibles uh, maybe is too long a list. So let me give you a whirlwind tour of the list, but not go through everything here. For people will be, he does play on the word filial. They'll be lovers of self. That would mean uh, filial auto, <laughs> the love of myself. You're not supposed to have that. You're supposed to have the love of the brothers and sisters, not the love of myself. So it, he t does a play on love here through this passage, but of the word filial, one of the words for love. For people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, does the same thing there, boasters, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. Wow. Uh, by the way, do you know what the word for ungrateful is? You know that gratitude is you, charis. Remember, Eucharist? Guess what ungrateful is? Ah, charis. See, now you're learning Greek. You all know that if you put an A in front of a word, it usually means no or not. Kata is, again, a no or not, but sometimes stronger, uh, before a word, when it's attached to a word. So now he uses the word ah, charis, away from grace. And so that, and then that's translated ungrateful. Unholy. Inhuman. By the way, for inhuman, there's an interesting word. Uh, C.S. Lewis in his Four Loves, I hate to keep talking about Lewis, but I am a Lewis. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, expositional teaching of Lewis. But Lewis wrote a book called The Four Loves, and people who are baffled by reading that book know that he talks about filio, he talks about eros, he talks about agape, and guess what the fourth word is that nobody, most 
uh, people that I've talked to say, well, what in the world is that word? Stargate. Stargate. Because Lewis knows that in the Greek language is a major word for love. Storge, S-T-O-R-G-E, storge is the word for the love of an animal for its child, a mother lion and her cub. Uh, not the male tiger and the cub, because, <laughs> you know, tigers, the male tiger will kill any cub to put the, the female back in heat. But that's why the male, the mother tiger has to protect her cub for two years against all males. Did you know that? They have to hide them because a male will kill the cub to put the female back into heat. But not a lion and not the, uh, the mother's care of the, of the cubs is storge. And that word is one of the love words. Uh, it is the love of a mother for a child. It's the physical love you have for your bl for blood, your, your own children. Okay, it's a good word. It's not used in the New Testament very often, but it is used in combined words. For instance, filial storge is in the book of Romans, the love of, uh, of humanity and the love of, the, of your neighbor. It's filial storge, again, because seeing storge as the love of, of a human like you would love your children. And it's used by Paul in one of his lists there in Romans. You should love uh, one another like the love of a mother for her child. And that is filial love, storge. Here it's used negatively. It's a storge. And a storge, and I agree with the translators, not, uh, not, not yeah, this trans, I like the new RSV. They translated it inhuman against humanity. See, inhuman. And that is the uh, ah storge. That is bad love. I mean, against the love even that you would have for your own blood, even you'd have for a little baby lion or a, a baby in the family. So ah storge is inhuman, implacable, slanderers, profligates, brutes. I'm not going to exegete any of these. Haters of good, they're pretty obvious. Treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Uh, by the way, the word for conceit there is typhoon, which means puffed up, swollen with. In fact, he actually is a play on 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 words, swollen with swollen up. He, he dub, double writes that swollen with being puffed up. So that's conceit. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Again, play on the word filial. Holders of an outward form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid them. For among them are those who make their way into households and captivate, I don't like silly women. Uh, actually, uh, the word is little women in the Greek text. I don't know why the RSV and other translators do not translate it silly women. They translate it young women. It should be young, very young women. And so the, these young women that are, that are overwhelmed by their sins, swayed by all kinds of desires. Okay. And so take that and put a circle around it and say the, the, correct, the correct translation is young women who are always being instructed and can never arrive at a knowledge of the truth. And then he mentions two names, Janus and Jambres. Now it's interesting because in Exodus 7, 11, we know that two magicians in Pharaoh's house uh, did a, a, tried to do a stunt to outwit Moses and Aaron, but they're not named. They're not named in Exodus. They are named in the Jewish Targums, intertestamental books where the Jewish uh, commentaries on the Old Testament. And in a Jewish commentary called the Targum, mid, written in about the 100 BC, they're named Janus and Jambres. And so Paul shows that he's read that Targum. So he gives the name that the Targum has. It's not from Exodus. Exodus just says two magicians. So Janus and Jambres oppose Moses, and so these people of corrupt mind and counterfeit faith also oppose the truth. But they will not make much progress because in the case of these two men, uh, their folly became plain to everyone. They couldn't turn their stick into a snake. <laughs> well, they did turn their stick into a snake, but then Aaron's snake ate their snake. So, I mean, it didn't work. Right. Their magician trick did not work. Uh, and so everybody even saw it, even Pharaoh saw it, that it didn't work. 
And so Paul has a little humorous uh, line there that even their trick didn't work. And so he says, you're living in a time where there's a lot, I'm just going to quickly summarize it all. We're living in a confusing time <laughs> where there's a lot of confusing jumble of false loves. And of course, I'm not sure it's good and healthy to pr uh, preach on this in your church, to preach on all the false loves of your generation. I don't know. A little bit goes a long way. And I think Paul could have shortened it a great deal, but he does throw them all in. Maybe just a little bit of overkill there. But it is true, we're living in a time of many false loves. Now, verse 10. Now you observe, which I jumped to earlier. <laughs> you showed that I had a Freudian slip. I wanted to get past all this. Didn't want to have to read all this uh, stuff. But now we're over. You've observed my teaching and my conduct, my aim, my way of life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfast. You know, you know me. Uh, by the way, you know the word for observe? is you have followed along with me. You have been my companion. And I think you should circle observe, take observe out, because that would be a whole different uh, Greek word. And the actual word is para kaluthasen. It means para, you have walked with me. And so circle observe and make it walked with me. It's a whole different game to say you saw me from a distance, you walked with me through these things. And you know, you know me. And so he is leaving that in Timothy's hands to say, Timothy, you have walked with me. You know my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love. You may have pluses or minuses and some of those things for me, but you know me. And then you know what happened to me. And you know about my sufferings. And now he uses the word for suffering. And the things that happened to me in, now look at the list, in Antioch, in Iconian, in Lystra. You were there. Remember, I, I started off with that. They, he may have been one of the guys that helped rescue him from the stoning. And what persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. By the way, the word persecute is a bad word. Did you know the word means literally, uh, diogoas, means to uh, run down. It literally is the Greek word to run down. He uses it in a positive way. He makes a joke about it in another place where he says, I want you to run down the truth. I want you to get a hold of the truth, but not to run down people. And to run down a person, do you know it was used in the gladiator games to refer to charioteers who would literally, people would be thrown in the arena and the chariots would run them down. And the word for run them down is this word persecute, to run someone down into the ground. And, and actually it would kill them. And he says, you know that's happening. There is persecution. And persecution is a person being run down. And uh, we, ju we don't have to do much historical uh, surveys in the 20th century without knowing where that's happened to people. And it's just absolutely horrible. They were run down. And, and anyway, you know my suffering. You know what happened to me. And what persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. See, he doesn't dwell on it. He says, uh, I'm rescued from them. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There will be a kind of running down that will happening. And But as for me, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've known the sacred, the holy, that's the same word that's in the word Jerusalem, holy, the holy writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. We're almost finished now with the third chapter, and then if, after the break, after we have some discussion of this chapter, we'll do the fourth. All scripture, he says, is God-breathed. It's inspired by God. Here's Paul's doctrine of the inspiration of scripture. The scripture, in other words, is faithful. You can count on it. It'll always bring you to its living center. That's Calvin, and I agree with that. By God, it's useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And notice how he brings it to its conclusion. So that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient and equipped for every good work. And then uh, you realize that the goal of 
scripture is to bring us and train us in righteousness, in the truth. And the truth is found in the Lord of the truth, Jesus Christ himself. So the Bible is, a, is the, the document that he wants Paul to teach and to carefully teach it, patiently teach it. He has more to say in the fourth chapter. We'll save it for then because he has some really interesting things to say in the, in the fourth chapter on that. But right now, he said, you were raised with the, he means now the Old Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament. And of course, we now in the Reformed faith add the New Testament books to that sacred canon. But the canon is inspired by God. It's his, it's not a, it, there is, this is not a text on infallibility. Uh, the, uh, I think that, you know, I agree with the, uh, the, the word infallible that came up into uh, biblical uh, teaching in the 20th century is a mischievous word. Uh, Carl Henry, I was with him once in a conference where he said, that's a mischievous word because we don't know what it means. Does it mean the Bible can't correct itself and there can't be corrections? There are corrections. We know they're there. But it is faithful because it brings you to the living center. And that is better than saying it's an errant, any, anything the Bible says on any subject has got to be the absolute truth. Really? Jesus said the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. It's not. Did that ruin the parable for you? No. Uh, it, it is just not, that, that's not fair. Let the text be the text. When a parable is told in the text, let it be a parable. When something is mysterious and wondrous and you can't understand it, then step back and say one wonders. Uh, but the text will always bring you to its living center. And that's what he means. It brings you to righteousness. And so he's not curious with the fact that you're going to prove how flawless the text is. Rather, the text is God-breathed. It's what God wants you to have to bring you to its living center. And he wants Timothy to teach it, to teach it faithfully. Okay, I'm going to stop right here because we do have uh, now 25 minutes, and, uh, and then we'll have another break, and then we have our final session. Uh, but now Rick Osmer, who's a tremendous guy, and I'm honored that you're now willing. I'm going to give you...